All right. Now, when we ended last week, we were well into 3, 1 to 5, and I want to read that again, and then I'll wrap that up. But he says, therefore, when we could no longer bear it, we decided to be left in Athens by ourselves and sent Timothy, our brother and fellow worker for God and the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. Indeed, you yourselves know that we're destined for this. For even when we were with you, we were predicting to you that we would be afflicted, and so it turned out as you know. For this reason, I myself, being no longer able to bear it, sent to learn about your faith, fearing that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. Their concern, the concern of these missionaries, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, for the Thessalonians' welfare... It's so great that they sent Timothy to to them to strengthen and encourage them in the faith so that they, the Thessalonian Christians, wouldn't be shaken by the persecutions they were experiencing. The Thessalonians, they knew that Christians are destined for afflictions because the missionaries had predicted as much and their prediction had been borne out even when they were there. They let them know that this is embracing the Lord Jesus and becoming a disciple carries with it this likelihood of distress and persecution and hardship. And then Paul sent Timothy to learn how their faith was faring, fearing that the tempter somehow had tempted them, had pulled them from the faith through the opposition and the persecution. And you can see how that would work, that here are these these people, here come these missionaries, they get caught up, yes, yes, they go with the missionaries are now gone, having been run out, their families are against them, their neighbors are against them, they're getting persecuted. And you can see how the enemy would work in that to pull them from the faith. And Paul is very concerned about that. He's concerned that, that, and though the opposition and persecution, as I said last week, though that comes through people, Paul understands that ultimately who's behind it? It's the tempter. You see, the tempter is at work, and he, he works through things. And Paul is concerned, and he, he sees that their abandoning the faith is a real possibility. Because he says here, fearing that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. So if, if the tempter was successful in getting them to abandon their commitment and surrender and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, well then Paul's labor would have been in vain because they had gone there to bear fruit for God and now that fruit was gone because they had abandoned their faith. So Paul sees that as a real possibility that their labor would have been in vain. Then he says in 3, 6 to 10, But now Timothy has come to us from you and has told us good news about your faith and love and that you always have a fond memory of us, longing to see us as we also long to see you. Because of this, brothers, we were encouraged about you in all our distress and affliction by your faith. For we now live if or since you are standing firm in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on account of you? As night and day we pray most earnestly to see your face and to complete the shortcomings of your faith. So Timothy returns, he's been dispatched, sent there to find out Paul's concern. What effect are these persecutions having on this new church, on these these Christians there? And Timothy brings good news about the Thessalonians' faith in Christ, their love for God and for one another, and their longing to see the missionaries. And this evidence of the vitality of the Thessalonians' faith, it encourages Paul. And Paul's companions, despite the distress and the affliction that are a constant part of Paul's ministry. So Paul is always under siege. He has his distress and afflictions, but despite those things, getting this news that they are standing firm in the faith 
was a great encouragement. And you, you recall that after being forced out of Thessalonica, just to picture, you know, how Paul's ministry was. You know, we look at him and say, well, he's an apostle. You know, he's just floating over everything and he's, you know, going from triumph to triumph. Well, ultimately he is. But he's doing that in this world. And he's facing a great deal of affliction and difficulty. He was forced out of Thessalonica. And then they faced similar treatment in Berea. And then Paul was mocked in Athens for preaching the resurrection of Christ. The opposition continued in Corinth, as you see in Acts 18. That's the place from which 1 Thessalonians is written. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, when he writes to the church in Corinth that he was, he was with the Corinthians in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So this is a, this is a, rough, uh, a rough gig to be somebody who's going out and preaching the gospel of Christ in this world. Now the state of the Thessalonians' faith, it was so important to the missionaries. They were so invested in that. It was so significant that having received the good news about it, they say that they now live. They now live. See, they mean that their love for the Thessalonians is such that this news they've received about the ongoing vibrancy of their faith, that's provided a new sense of strength and joy for them. You see, it's something that their, their lives have been uplifted and renewed in vigor. It's like, you know, we're living, we're getting afflicted, we're being persecuted, but we're carrying on in faith, and then here comes this news, and it's like, whoa! You know, it's like an adrenaline rush. This shot that that church that you planted that you've been worried about, well, let me tell you about them. And they're just like over the moon, we would say. You see, just so thrilled. Just so thrilled that this is, this is happening. And the news of the Thessalonians' faith, it gave them such joy that they wondered how they could ever thank God enough for it. Look how he expresses it in verse 9. There, how can we ever say enough to God? For the joy that you have brought us. They're praying steadily and earnestly to see the Thessalonians again. And to provide what's lacking in their faith. And you see in this how important the notion of brotherhood was. Right? They, they come travel. They go to Thessalonica. They convert these people who were before strangers. Now what's happened? Now look how invested in them they are. They can say that we now live when we hear about you. We're concerned about your faith. We want to make up whatever's lacking in your faith. Brotherhood meant something. It wasn't simply a word that was said. The fact people are in Christ ties us to them in a very deep and special way. And you see that exemplified in Paul's life, not just here, but you see it in many places. In verses 11 to 13 of chapter 3, he says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Like he tells them, we're praying all the time that we can come to you. Now you see the prayer. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and to abound in love for one another and for everyone, as we too have love for you, so as to establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his holy ones. Amen. Now they pray that God the Father himself and the Lord Jesus will prepare their way to come to the Thessalonians. Just as they said they'd been praying in, in, verse, in verse 10, here they are praying. They're asking that God will prepare the way, that he will direct them, that he will open the door for them. That's quite possibly directed at the removal of some satanic obstacle. You know that Paul had said that he'd wanted to come again and again, but they'd been thwarted by Satan. That may explain why Paul adds himself after God the Father. We're praying that God the Father himself 
You see, that may be something that he might be contrasting his own repeated and ineffectual attempts to get around Satan's obstacles with the need for more direct divine intervention. You see, I'm praying that God will intervene powerfully. I've been trying this. I've been seeking. I've been trying, and I've been thwarted by Satan. So will God open the door? Will he direct the way to us? And though Paul clearly distinguishes between the persons, God the Father and the Lord Jesus, he also assumes that they're in some way unified, which is perfectly in keeping with the Trinity, right? There's a difference in person, but there's a unity in being. And you see this very subtly reflected in what Paul does here. He assumes they're clearly, he distinguishes between them, but he assumes that they're in some sense unified because you see God the Father and the Lord Jesus, that's a compound subject. Right? It's like Stephen Bob. God the Father and the Lord Jesus, and yet Paul describes their action with a singular verb. Now that's going you know, to, we have that, right? I mean, our verb form is not as radical as something you see in Greek, but we have variations, right? If you take a third person singular he, will you say that he throws the ball? You take a third person plural they, and they throw. There's no S. Right? So you wouldn't say Steve and Bob throws. You wouldn't take a compound subject and use a singular verb. But that's exactly what Paul does with God the Father and the Lord Jesus. Now, Gordon Fee in his commentary, he says that he, Paul, does this in such a matter-of-fact way and without explanation or argumentation is at the same time sure evidence that he must have previously instructed them not only on the saving work of Christ, but also on who the divine Savior actually was. And Paul does the same thing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now they pray for the Lord Jesus to cause the Thessalonians, this is their, they're praying that the Lord Jesus will cause the Thessalonians to increase and to abound in love for one another and for everyone, which includes those outside of the Christian faith. Those who are persecuting them. He prays that their love for them will abound. They're praying that the Thessalonians' love will increase and abound to be like the love that they, the missionaries, have for the Thessalonians. Now that says an awful lot. To me about the love that the missionaries have for the Thessalonians and that says again that there's something about brotherhood about being bound together and caring about one another and having this kind of family tie that is not a blood relationship but is a spiritual relationship and you see it reflected there and notice how Paul who's a Jew for whom the Shema, the Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, notice how Paul, this Jew for whom this Shema is a fundamental confession, he addresses his prayer both to God the Father and God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, without any hint of monotheistic discomfort. He just does it matter-of-factly. He just does it like that. And as Fee says, he says, here is a strict monotheist praying with ease to both the Father and the Son, focusing first on the one and then the other, without a sense that his monotheism is being stretched or is in some kind of danger. Paul doesn't reflect that at all here. You see, and you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, a, a text that I've mentioned a number of times, you see there how Paul, by the Spirit, Paul conceives the essential unity of the Father and the Son. And regarding that text, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, David Garland says, Paul creatively Christianizes the foundational Jewish monotheistic confession, the Lord our God 
is one Lord. He glosses the reference to Lord and God in that confession so that God refers to the Father and the Lord refers to Christ. So you see how the Spirit is showing us in many ways. But these are just the more subtle ways that he's showing us that there is distinction and unity. And so you see that here uh, lurking in what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians. Now the result or goal of the growth in love for which they're praying, he says, is to establish the Thessalonians' hearts blameless in holiness in God's presence at Jesus' coming. To establish their hearts blameless in holiness in God's presence at Christ's coming. Jesus is, of course, coming back. You see it in John 14, Revelation 1-7. You see it in many other places. And he's coming in glory with his holy angels, as Paul mentions here. You see in Mark 8, 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. He says in 2 Thessalonians, which Lord willing we'll get to, This will happen at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, when he meets out punishment to those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 14 and 15, and Enoch the seventh, seventh from Adam also prophesied about these men saying, Behold, the Lord is coming with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment against all and to convict every person concerning all of their works of godlessness which they godlessly performed and concerning all of the harsh things which godless sinners have spoken against him. Christians live in this blessed hope of the Lord's return to consummate the kingdom and bring about the eternal perfect state the, the divine utopia, that reality in which there'll be no death or mourning or crying or pain. Gene Green in his commentary, he says, The Lord Jesus will come with power and glory as a warrior on the day of the Lord, and his holy ones will come with him. Here at the close of this section of the letter, Paul's prayer introduces one of the great themes of the second part of this letter, the coming of the Lord. He will come with armies greater than those of Alexander the Third, as Alexander the Great, or the Romans. He is the coming king whom they await. He is the coming king whom we await. He will come and finish and finalize and consummate the kingdom that he inaugurated. The one we experience in this overlap of ages between his coming and his coming again. And so this is what, when he talks about this, Paul says this, uh, you know, he wants, he wants them to direct the way to them. And then he says here, to establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his holy ones. He's, he's asking for that. Now, it's not obvious to me how abounding in love for people how that translates into establishing one's heart blameless in holiness at the return of Jesus. Now, I'll tell you what I think he means. I think it establishes one's heart. It fortifies that heart or allows one to stand confidently on that day because love understood as a sacrificial commitment to another's welfare. Not simply as a feeling or an emotion, but understood as a sacrificial commitment to some much like you would have to your child. We seem to have a better ability to grasp love in that context. You understand that it's that sacrificial commitment to do good for them. To do what they need to bless them. Alright, so... Understood that way as a sacrificial commitment to another well, another's welfare. Love, then, it motivates 
And it summarizes a genuinely ethical life. A life in which one treats other people as God desires. And I've pointed this out many times in Romans 13. You see, owe nothing to anyone except the well-known to love one another. For the one who loves the other has fulfilled the law. For the well-known, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in, the, in this word, in the command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not work evil against a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. It is an umbrella, you see, that motivates and summarizes an ethical life. A life that is lived in the way God would have it lived. And the result of that faithful living, you see, the result of that faithful living, the other side of the love coin, the result of that faithful living is an inner assurance that one is blameless in the matter of holiness. Not meaning that one is sinless. You know better than that but that one is exemplary in conforming to God's character. And that will yield confidence that will establish one's heart before God because it confirms the reality of one's allegiance to the Savior. Now you say, that seems kind of a, a lot of stuff to read into that. Okay, it's not clear to me. I think that's what he means. But it's the same idea that John expresses decades later in 1 John. For example, in 1 John 2, 3 to 6, he says, and by this we know that we have come to know him. Well, we're speaking now about this inner assurance. He says, if we keep his commandments. All right, the one who says, I have come to know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. And in this one, the truth is not, but whoever keeps his word Truly in this one, the love of God has reached perfection. By this we may know we are in Him. Well, how can I be confident of that? How can I know that? By this we may know that we are in Him. The one who claims to abide in Him ought himself to walk just as that one walked. Then John says in 3, 18 to 20, Little children, let us not love in word and tongue, but in action and truth. By this... We will know that we are of the truth and will reassure our heart before him whenever our heart condemns us for God is greater than our heart and knows everything. You see, so I think there is a connection to assurance. You see, the fact obedience is inadequate to save anybody because it's imperfect doesn't mean it must be irrelevant to one's sense of assurance. It looks to me like God has given this to us to help put our hearts at rest. Because as we sit here and wonder and say, well, am I this and am I that? We can see the reality of our allegiance to God in that it has transformed our life. Perfectly, of course not. But you can look at your life and see that God is at work in me. And you can take comfort in that. You never think, well, I'm then deserving something and because of that I'm achieving something before God. No, it's something that will help ease your heart and put it at rest because it bears witness to the reality of your allegiance to the Lord Jesus. Okay, it manifests itself in your life. All right, I said it's not clear to me, but I think that's what Paul is after. I think that's what Paul is talking about. So there you have my, uh, my take on it. First, in, verses, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, he says, Furthermore, then, brothers, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction about how you must walk so as to please God, as indeed you are walking, you do so even more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Now here, the first, at the beginning of this uh, verse there, I've rendered it furthermore. Almost all English translations uh, render it finally. 
okay, which suggests that it's the very last topic of the letter, but the meaning of that word is more flexible than that, and it can function simply as a transition to something new. So I think it's better to go with furthermore, that's like in keeping with the King James, or you could go with something like the NIVs, as for other matters, because I just think saying finally to English readers, when you see it, you think, well, what happened? <laughs> You see, and I just think the word's more flexible than that. But in light of their desire to remedy any lack in the Thessalonians' faith, in light of that that you see in 310, and the prayer that the Thessalonians may, by abounding in love, end up with hearts that are blameless in holiness, they then move to exhorting the brothers, and this of course includes the sisters, they move to exhorting them to right living. He said, there is a way that Christians must live. There's a way that Christians must live, walk. It's a metaphor for conducting one's life. There's a way that Christians must live so as to please God. The fact we are saved without question by the grace of God doesn't mean that God is indifferent to how we live. The God who saves us calls us to a life of submission and obedience. He calls us to be different. He calls us to be holy. And the missionaries previously had instructed them about how they must live and those instructions he said were given by the authority of the Lord Jesus right so to disobey those instructions about how they must walk to please God it wasn't to disobey Paul or Silas it was to disobey the Lord it was to disobey him they gave those instructions through the Lord Jesus and so that's something that's very important. Now, even though they were living in accordance with the will of God, as Paul encourages them and points that out, the missionaries, they urged them to do so even more. You see, to do so even more, the Christian life is a constant pursuit of Christlikeness. It is a constant pursuit. We are to call each other upward in that pursuit that is not a bad thing that is not something for which someone needs to apologize now, I'm not talking about coming in and being rude to people I'm talking about encouraging and calling and challenging people to live lives devoted to God you see and this is what they're doing and the missionaries they're aware of areas you are walking this way you're living this way but they are aware of areas in which the Thessalonians especially needed to grow this is Christian living it is a constant pursuit of Christ likeness it is something we will not reach until that day until the Lord's return you see but we are to call and urge one another we are not simply a social club. We are holy people, set apart by God. And we are to encourage one another in that direction. And then Paul says in 3.8, following on that, he says, For this is God's will, your sanctification. You must abstain from sexual immorality. You must walk so as to please God, you must abstain from sexual immorality. Each of you are to know how to control his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one wrong or take advantage of his brother in this matter. For the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As indeed we previously told you and warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in sanctification, in holiness, in being His people. 
He didn't call us to impurity. Did he save us by grace? Of course he did. But what does he call us to as people who have been rescued by grace? He calls us in sanctification. He says, therefore, the one who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. Paul now gets particular. He gets particular about an area in which they need to increase their conformity to the will of God. God's will for them, an important part of how they are to be sanctified, is that they abstain from sexual immorality. God specifically, he specifically forbids sex outside of marriage. God specifically forbids it. It is sinful. And the fact you are in love is not an exception. Sam Storms wrote in a column recently, he says, every Greek lexicon or dictionary of the New Testament is in agreement that porneia refers to any form of sexual activity before or outside the relationship of monogamous marriage between a man and a woman. It can refer to premarital sex, adultery, homosexual practice, prostitution, bestiality, and all other expressions of sexual activity outside the marital relationship between a husband and wife. If you want to continue living in unrepentant sexual sin, call yourself culturally sophisticated, call yourself socially liberated, call yourself in step with changing times, just don't call yourself a Christian. You see, they say, well, you know, look, you understand there is a difference between people, right? Where somebody sits here and says, I struggle with something. We are talking about people who are living in sexual immorality. Who are simply saying, I don't care about that. I'm going to live this way. And we could multiply texts that say that is an affront to God. Now, what are we to do as people who are called to be holy? You can't just say, well, you know, so what? You know, I'm particular. personally, I'm not into it, but, you know, they want to live together. And they, no. How do you think God sees that? Yeah, it, it's absolute. Now, of course, every society prescribes, every society prescribes the method of marriage, the act or acts by which a couple goes from being unmarried to being married. And we have some today who wear the name Christ are living together in a sexual relationship without having gotten married. And they salve their consciences with the lie that they're really married because they're committed to each other. You sometimes say, well, who needs a piece of paper? Well, anybody who wants to be married. That's who needs it. Living together in a sexual relationship does not constitute a marriage. Living in a sexual relationship does not constitute a marriage. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, after having had five husbands, she was living in a sexual relationship with a man. And yet Jesus tells her in John chapter 4 verse 18 that this man with whom she's living is not her husband. She said, well, wait a minute, we're living together. And so that makes us husband. No, it doesn't. There is a thing called marriage. And by the way, people who say, well, it's just a piece of paper. Well, then why not just do it? And I'll tell you why not to do it. Because you don't want that level of commitment. That's why. But God says, 
you are to be married if you are to if you're engaging in sexual relationship cohabiting in a sexual relationship without marriage it's simply sexual immorality it has no place in a Christian's life it has no place in the church of Christ it has no place for people who are seeking to be what God wants them to be so we have to repent of that you see and he's telling them this about sexual sin now it's understood that sexual desire, that these Thessalonians, Paul understands that sexual desire will tempt them in the wrong direction. I mean, not only was sexual promiscuity, not only was it rampant in the ancient Greco-Roman world, but a number of pagan religions of the day, including the most popular religions in Thessalonica, they had a significant sexual component to them. So you look around at our culture. Our culture is just sex obsessed. It absolutely tells every young person growing up that if you are not, you know, with somebody, hooking up, doing whatever it is, that you're missing life itself. That you are missing life. And young people with hormones raging in that environment that's fanning that, it tempts them, and of course, that's what was happening in Thessalonica. But on top of that, they had religions where you could go and engage in sex, and you could do it as honoring some kind of God. So they had even another level of enticement into immorality, and Paul is well aware of that. But rather than giving in to the lustful passion, Paul says, rather than doing that, like the Gentiles who don't know God, they have to learn to gain control over their vessel. Now, meaning, at the very least, their bodies, but probably more specifically, their sex organ. They have to learn to gain control over their vessel in sanctification and honor. You're not to run around like the Gentiles, like the pagans who don't know God. You know God. You've been redeemed. You've been saved at an incredible cost. What does that mean to you? Well, you honor God in what you do with your body. You honor Him. You control your sexual appetite in sanctification and honor. The body belongs to the Lord and they must use it in a way that honors Him, which includes abstaining from sexual immorality. Okay? No sex outside of marriage. And in our society, you know how crazy that is? Who can possibly do that? God's people. That's what He's talking about here. These Christians in Thessalonica, surrounded by this stuff, does Paul say, well, I understand it's tough. Why don't you go ahead and get some on the side? He doesn't do that. He says, you're to abstain from sexual immorality. Jeffrey Wyman, his commentary, says, this persistent emphasis on holiness reveals an important truth about the theological perspective from which Paul views the Thessalonian believers and issues his exhortations to them. Holiness was the defining characteristic and desire, desired purpose for Israel, God's covenant people. It was the attribute by which the people of God were to be distinguished from all other nations. What's surprising and even astonishing, however, is that Paul applies this standard of holiness to predominantly Gentile believers in Jesus at Thessalonica. The holiness that has previously been the characteristic distinguishing Israel from the Gentile nations has now also become the boundary marker that separates the Thessalonian Gentile believers from the Gentiles who do not know God, those who are outside God's holy people. 
Paul, it seems clear, views his Gentile converts at Thessalonica as the renewed Israel, as those who together with Jewish Christians are now full members of God's covenant people. And on the basis of their privileged new position, he exhorts them in 4, 3 to 8 to exhibit the holiness that God's people have always been called to possess. Isn't that clear? That that's what Paul is doing? That's what he's calling him to? First Peter chapter 1. Verses 14 to 16. I wanted to read this before I already sent the, uh, the PowerPoint to Bernard. 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. Peter says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. The world should understand the church and see the church as a beacon of holiness. That's how we ought to be understood and seen. Who are we? And we're, we almost are afraid to be holy because we think if you are holy, then people will think you're holier than thou. And so we don't really want to be holy. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to give off too much holiness. Because then people think we're so Well, can't we do both? Can't we truly live holy lives without sitting here and coming across to people? Like, listen, you are in the world. We are the community of believers. We live our lives for the glory of God. We're not going to compromise that. We're not going to change that. We would love you to join us. And can we do that without looking down our nose at those who have not yet come and joined. I think we can. And I think we have to. Because that's something that God calls us to. Now the phrase where he says that, that no one wrong, that one not wrong or take advantage of his brother in this matter, that sounds like a specific application of this principle to something that's going on in Thessalonica. That's how that sounds to me. Paul seems to be alluding to a situation where a brother's lust had led him to pursue sexual interactions, sexual intentions, had led him to that with either another brother's wife or perhaps a brother's daughter. That this person's lust had led him to that. And Paul rebukes the man anonymously. Perhaps he's unsure about the facts. I heard that bell. Or unsure about the details. Let me just finish this. You know, for trying to, he rebukes him for trying to destroy that brother's relationship with his wife. Or if it's involved a daughter, rebukes him for trying to dishonor that person's daughter and his family. And to deprive that brother of his daughter's value as a bride in that culture. So he's looking and saying, listen, don't do this and don't act this way. That would be wrong and it would constitute taking advantage of a brother's trust in allowing social access to his wife or his daughter as part of Christian fellowship. That's what I suspect is going on, is that someone has either through the openness of the body of Christ and this social interaction that was allowed in the community has then gone off with the, somebody's wife or somebody's daughter and has abused that and not only has sinned that way but has wronged their brother in doing it. Like I said, it sounds like there's something specific going on in Thessalonica here. I'm over time. Heard that bell. Thanks for hanging in.